All right, looks like we are live. Welcome to Standing for Truth. I am your host, Donnie. I want to thank everybody for being here for tonight's important debate on is evolution a reasonable scientific theory. This is our 10th debate in the 2022 Evolution Debate Challenge Series. We have been having a ton of fun with this series. And tonight we've got James W., who will be uh, defending the position of evolu evolutions on trial tonight. So we're looking forward to it. We've also got Dr. Ken Hoven, of course. And uh, gentlemen, thank you so much for giving us your time for tonight's important debate. Thank you, Don. Thank Good you to be here. here. My privilege. Uh, as we always do, though, let's kind of break the ice, get to know the uh, debaters a little bit before we get the party started. Uh, James, it's your first time uh, debating on this platform, so I appreciate you doing this. And why don't we start with you? A little bit about yourself. Uh, go ahead, James. So I ho host a show on the Amy Newman channel. We do at least three to four open mics every week. We do shows. We invite believers to come on, tell us why they believe, and we let them come on and make their case. And uh, I was a born and raised as a Christian, but in 2014, I gave my life over to reason and evidence, and I became an atheist. All right. I appreciate that introduction there, James W. I've got your uh, your channel linked in the description box. So for anybody who likes what they're hearing from James and wants to see more, please check the description box for that. Uh, Dr. Dino, good to see you. Uh, how you been and a, a little bit about yourself? I've uh, been great. I'm excited. James, has he changed because of reason and evidence for evolution. Reason and I evidence. want to see that. I've been looking for that for a long time. I think there's none. Anyway, I've been fine, brother. Uh, Lenox, Alabama, we're building our dinosaur adventure land. Visitors coming all the time from all over the place. And we just give tours and stuff on teaching science in the Bible. We believe the Bible is literally true. God made everything in six days. I take the position. It's true. In the Ten Commandments, God wrote on a rock with his finger. He said, remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. He said, in six days, the Lord made heaven and earth. The Bible clearly teaches a six-day creation. And when you add up the dates, you get about 6,000 years ago. And you can do that easily going through Genesis 5 and Genesis 11. We've got plenty of historical evidence from Joseph on. So the Bible says God made everything in six days. We produce a lot of videos on the topic. We do a whole series, 18 bucks, 18 hours, if you want to get that for 50 bucks. And watch it, recopy it, return it, get your money back. Can't beat that. We've got a lot of materials to help strengthen your faith in the Word of God. Jesus said the creation of Adam was the beginning. I believe he was right. Anybody believes otherwise is calling Jesus a liar or claiming the Bible is lying, one or the other. I don't think you can get out of that. So anyway, excited to be here. I just want to defend the Bible. You can come visit Dinosaur Adventure Land. It's free. Come on down. So go ahead. I want to see this evidence James has. I've been waiting for this. <laughs> I appreciate that introduction, we'll Dr. Dino. <laughs> this is definitely going to be a lot of fun. Probably another one to, to remember. Uh, one that we had a week ago was uh, Dr. Dino and T-Jump. That one's been getting a lot of great one for the feedback. Ages. That one was... Uh, a wild debate. So if you haven't yet seen that uh, in the audience, to everyone in the audience, please check that out. So anyways, for the audience sake, I'm going to go over the format for tonight. As always, we're keeping it professional and formal. Uh, James is going to be uh, kicking us off with his uh, opening statement. So whatever he takes, roughly 10 to 12 minutes, we're going to give uh, Dr. Dino equal time. Then we're going to have a roughly six minute uh, uninterrupted rebuttal. Then we're going to have a discussion. We're going to keep it free flowing, equally time while we discuss one topic or one point at a time. Then, of course, we're going to have five-minute concluding statements. And then this is where we get you guys in the audience involved. We're going to have an audience Q&A. So please make sure you are tagging me with your questions at Standing for Truth, and that way I won't miss them. Okay, let's get right into the fun. James, we're going to hand it over to you. Uh, whatever you take, um, we'll give uh, Kent equal time. So whenever you're ready, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Donnie. Thank you, Kent. So. I just want to ask the people watching first, if evolution were true, would you want to know? And that is uh, a question you have to ask because I think a lot of people out there, they don't want to know if it's true. They don't want it to be true. But things are going to be true regardless of whether you want them to be true, regardless of what it does to your theology. The truth is just going to keep on being the truth. So evolution is a fact. It's a theory and a fact. A theory is a framework of facts that explain a phenomenon in nature, the highest order of thought in science. And the theory of evolution is based on reproduction with variation. 
That is, each generation has a certain number of mutations that it's born with, and they can accumulate more as they grow. And these mutations can be passed on to offspring. And that may or may not give that offspring an advantage or disadvantage in terms of reproduction. If it gives it an advantage, that mechanism that it works by. So we have to first stress the fact that evolution, atheism, they're not religions because they're falsifiable. You could falsify evolution by showing that things that could not exist exist in a layer of strata where they cannot exist. We've never seen that. We see uniformitarian strata all over the earth. And evolution is not all about death, as a lot of people like to straw man it. Evolution is a celebration of life. You know right now that each and every single one of your ancestors was a survivor. And many of them lived on the earth when conditions were much more hostile than they are today. We have it compar comparatively easy going back even to our early hominid ancestors where the next meal was not guaranteed. And even that early shrew-like ancestor who emerged at the edge of the dinosaurs when they went extinct and bravely conquered a new world. What we do know is that organisms change over time. Reproduction with variation happens, and that's the driving mechanism of evolution, coupled with natural selection. So on the other side of that, we have God of the gaps. We have always had gaps in our knowledge, and humanity is always came up with explanations to fill those gaps. We have a diversity of life. We have organisms that don't look real. They look nothing like each other. And it's no surprise that ancient man thought that these were not related. Of course they did. They didn't know any better. And it's really only been in the past 200 to 250 years that you have been able to question religious dogma without being threatened with ostracization or outright imprisonment or death. And when we began to have that freedom to look at the natural world, we saw things were very different than what people had previously believed. When we started looking in the ground, we started seeing creatures that nobody had ever seen before that don't match any descriptions. Even in antiquity, people were dumbfounded by this. What's going on here? Originally, a lot of people thought the devil was planting bones in the dirt to test their faith in God. But as time progressed, and as we learned more and more, we found that we discovered that 99% of the animals, over 99% of the animals in the fossil record, and it is a record, 99% of them are not existent today, which is the opposite of what you would expect with a recent creation. With a recent creation, you would expect, we know animals go extinct occasionally, it does happen, but you would expect almost every species we find to not be alive today. And that is what we find in the fossil record. Moving forward, we discovered DNA and RNA. We found that all life on Earth uses these same genetic materials. Now, I know Kent is going to say, well, that's evidence of a common designer. But that's a claim made without evidence, and it can be dismissed without it. We don't have any evidence of this designer. We never have. The only evidence we have is the point to something we say is designed and infer a designer from that. But we don't know that it was designed. We do know that painters make paintings, watchmakers make watches, Ford and Chevy make cars. We do not know anything about a disembodied genie, universe creating, life creating genie who proofs animals out of nothing. We've never seen one of those. We have no reason to think that that exists. In absence of that, we have to assume that a natural process prevails because that's all we have ever seen. We've never seen anything else. We've never came up with any answer in human history that required magic or anything of the sort. Every discovery we've made has been totally in line with naturalism. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> and a lot of uh, these creationists, they like to say that there's no new information. There's no, nothing new comes about. You are new information. We could go a trillion years of humanity and there would never be another person with your exact genetic makeup. You are a unique individual that has never lived before 
and you never will live again. That's new information, regardless of what anybody wants to uh, wants to believe. And it's important to consider for the discussion here what Kent does find reasonable because he doesn't think evolution is reasonable, but he does think it's reasonable that a book that talks about putting striped sticks in front of goats where they breed will produce striped offspring. I would say any book that mentions anything of the sort should be disqualified from speaking on matters of genetics or biology. Take it for what it is, but it's not meant to be a science text. And uh, that's not what we see in nature. People may find this hard to believe, but the goat herders of the Bronze Age did not know more about biology than modern science. And to consider evolution, you have to, you have to realize that the biggest strength of the theory is that it's supported by not just one or two lines of evidence, but multiple lines. Many lines of evidence all converge to point to the, the fact that species change over time and that the life that exists on Earth today has not always been this way. It was very different in the past. I think Ken Hovind will agree with that, but he's going to say it's for very different reasons than what the evidence actually shows. And some people don't want to connect the dots. They are happy in ignorance because it's what they want to believe. And I would never try to force anybody to change their beliefs. I'm just going to tell you what I believe. You keep on doing what you want to do. I'm just going to tell you what I think. And the limits to our knowledge are not a license to engage in fantasy and delusions of grandeur about getting to live forever, pretending that death somehow does not apply to us because we have no evidence of that. And just because we can't tell you exactly how a biogenesis happened does not mean we have to consider Bronze Age fables as on par with modern science. Take it for what it is. They didn't know anything about the natural world. We know better today. We don't have the excuse that they had. So in terms of evidence for evolution, one of the first things I want to point out, and I know Kent will be happy about this, is evidence from homology. We have here... Nichols drawings of embryos, and we see the similarities between all the different embryos of various species. And there are differences, okay, but there are more similarities than differences. And there's no rational realism reason this should be if these were separate, distinct, created kinds, but it makes all the sense in the world if they evolved over millions of years. And you can even see in these embryos, as Kent as well acquainted with the gill slits, and they are gill slits, by the way. Of course, they don't turn into gills in humans, but that's how evolution works. Evolution takes a base material, and it can do different things with it. Evolution takes the same basic material, and it could create a male reproductive system or a female reproductive system or something in between, as does sometimes happen. Nice of God to design it that way, right? Um, there's no reason, also reason to think that, actually also dolphins, if you look on their embryos, their blowhole is actually at the front of their nose, but it migrates to the top of their head as time goes on. And Haeckel did not fake his drawings. That is uh, a charge made without evidence. These are, these are works of art. Haeckel was an artist. And of course, in any art, there is some level of artistic license, but I would caution Kent about breaching the Ninth Commandment in claiming that this man, Ernest Takel, was convicted of fraud, unless he has evidence that he was convicted of fraud. Because the evidence we have is that he was a distinguished professor of biology and, or zoology and anatomy for 30 years after he made his drawings. Now he knew, very, he didn't know as much as we know today about evolution, so he got some of the details wrong. But then they came in and they tried to take photographs of these embryos and make them look much different than they actually are. Because if you knew how similar they are, you might just conclude that maybe they're related to each other. Or maybe God designed it that way and intentionally made it look like they were related to deceive people. Because God does say in the Bible that he's going to send people delusion. He is going to mislead people so that he can then punish them for falling for his delusion. And Kent is all, of course, he's going to say that 
how complex life is and that the simple the single cell is more complicated than a space shuttle but complexity on its own is not evidence of design design would be more indicated by simplistic efficiency and that's what we see compare the metric system to the American system of weights and measures. The metric system is a top-down design system designed to be easy and designed to work in the laboratory. The American system of weights and measures evolved over time, and you've got various overlapping units, and it's very hard for scientists to work with that in the laboratory, but it works in everyday use because it evolved that way. It fit people's needs. And so moving into the fossil record, we see a story. And no, we don't have to prove each indivi which individual ancestors procreated. That is a, uh, a fallacy because we know if we find an animal in the ground, we find their fossilized remains. We know one thing. We know that it definitely had parents. So we know it was not cut far off from a breeding population of its species. And we get to take a look, a snapshot at where that species was on its evolutionary journey. And it tells us a lot. And we see things that we would not maybe expect, like lungfish, fish that can walk on land and have lungs. They're still alive today. We look in the fossil record and we see animals like Tiktaalik, a transitionary species between fish and land walking mammals, lived about 390 million years ago. Moving on to Ichthyostegus, that lived 360 million years ago, that had more sturdy legs and a rib cage to protect so that it could breathe better on land. It was more adapted to live on land. And that's all evolution is. It's not about death. It's about making the next generation just a little bit better off, a little bit better able to survive. Everything dies. Nothing is going to live forever. Everything would die regardless of whether evolution is true or creation is true. Moving on, we see basal sword whales 40 million years ago. They actually have a blowhole not at the front of their snout like land animals and not at the top like modern whales. That blowhole is in the center of their snout. And we see animals like myocetus that had legs capable of walking is with fossils found all only among ocean life. It had webbed feet, head, head and it actually had teeth. We also have Protocetus, Duradon, whales that had legs that were actually capable of probably walking on land, but that were um, more inclined to live in the water. These animals share a lot of characteristics. In fact, genetics tell us they're most closely related to the hippopotamus. They have multi-chamber stomachs, internal testicles, and they have bones in their head that are unique to whales. These are transitional species between modern whales and land walking creatures. Uh, horse evolution has also been very well documented. We have lots of evidence for that. Uh, we see people will say that evolution has no evidence of new, new traits coming. Well, we have the evolution of feathers. There was a point in the fossil record where there were no feathers. And then after that, there were feathers. Reasonable to assume at that time, feathers must have arisen. And by the way, they arose on dinosaurs first, not on birds. God got the order wrong in creation because God said birds were created first when reptiles were clearly evolved first, as Kent is well acquainted with the farm, fish, amphibians, reptiles, mammals. Um, James, that's, that's time. All right. I appreciate that. Um, that went about 13 minutes. And, and I just thought at 13 minutes, we'll, we'll, we'll kind of wrap it up That's there fine. just so we have enough time. And, and I appreciate that opening statement just so we have enough time to uh, discuss sure. all the points. Also, James, 99% of your opening came in good. There was only uh, one issue that lasted about 10 seconds. And it seemed to be uh, when you were moving around with the cat. So maybe you bumped into uh, your phone. Or... So he, uh, other than that, it's good. Your he's our producer for the show. So he likes to <laughs> kind of watch the show, uh, sentient, okay. non-human animal. Well, but, uh, I appreciate it, uh, James. Thank you for the opening statement. And uh, we're going to hand it over to Kent now. Uh, equal time. So James took 13 minutes, and therefore, Kent, you get 13 minutes whenever you're ready. 
All right. Well, thank you so much for doing this, James. It sounds like you're an Aaron Nelson, Aaron Rod disciple, and you're reading script straight from his website. I don't know if that's true or not, but it's all <laughs> sounded awful familiar. I've seen it before. Uh, and I appreciate the analogy you gave. That's classic. The metric system versus the American English standard system. Our system's confusing. Weights, measures, lengths, they don't, you got to convert everything. Metric system is much easier. You said the metric system was designed top down. I agree. You said the English system evolved ran, you know, randomly and it's chaos. Good observation, James, think about it, okay? I think all of nature is designed and all fits together pretty good. The animals breathe in the oxygen, give off CO2. The plants breathe in CO2 and give off oxygen. You'd almost think it was designed top down if you didn't know better. But anyway, thank you. I'll use that example. I like that. Okay. You brought up quite a few points um, uh, from Mr. Nelson's site that I would like to uh, answer. You claim Haeckel's drawings are accurate. Uh, you are mistaken, okay? Or uh, somebody lied to you. The textbooks, and I've got a whole rack of them here, show that the baby in growing in the mother has gills like a fish. They're not gill slits. They're not even slits. They're folds of skin. I got the same in my elbow, okay? I can't breathe through them. I got some under my neck. Fat folks got a lot of them in their neck, okay? This is a lie I cover in my video number four. They are not gill slits, and it's not evidence for evolution. But at, with the purpose of this debate tonight is for you to provide evidence for evolution. Is that a reasonable theory to see that the embryos of these different animals have folds under their skin, under their chin? Therefore, they're related. That's the evidence that you presented. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to counter that, okay? Evidence from development, the textbook says. What do they mean? The similarity between early stages in development of many different animals helped convince Darwin that all forms of life shared common ancestor. Ernst Haeckel drew the drawings and they are fake and he admitted it on trial with his other professors, okay? Darwin considered this, this embryology thing you brought up, by far the strongest single class of facts in favor of his theory. Haeckel, who faked that he was a good artist and a good liar, he faked it. Tell him I said so, okay? Haeckel called it the biogenetic law. It's called, Haeckel made up the phrase ontogeny, that's the way the baby grows inside the mother, recapitulates or reenacts or goes through again, a phylogeny, the way things evolved. Fancy phrase, meaningless, okay? The presence of fish-like structures in these embryos. Wow. As if an embryo retains a memory of its origins and starts to copy them during its development. This is what is taught, and this is absolutely a lie. This idea that sick mind Freud came up with was ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny that the individual recapitulates the evolution of the entire series, species. That's why this big debate's going on now. Where's, were they having the debate about abortion up till the baby's 28 days old? The law got, they almost voted on it today, give the mother the option to kill the baby until it's 28 years, 20 to 28 days old. Well, if it's just going through fish, amphibian, reptile, mammal stage, it's not a human yet, it's just a fish. It's okay to kill it. That's the logic behind abortion, okay? They're lying. Those are not gills like a fish. This is lie number 12. Four branchial, uh, branchial arch, uh, arches, supposedly gill slits. They develop into bones in the ear, glands in the throat. They have nothing to do with breathing ever. They are lying to you. Those are not gill slits. This fellow's got five or six folds under his chin. Hillary had a bunch. She couldn't breathe through any of them. She couldn't think with anything either, okay? Uh, Haeckel said the turning point in his thinking was when he read Charles Darwin's book. So these two guys influenced each other. Darwin said, boy, I wish we had evidence for my theory. Haeckel said, I'll make you some. I teach embryology. So he faked some drawings for him. By 1868, many evolutionists were worried about the lack of evidence for Darwin's theory. Haeckel, one of the worried evolutionists, decided to manufacture some. The fraud began when he, with his family tree. And James, you and Aaron all believe in this family tree that everything is related and goes back to an amoeba. It's an orchard. There's a tree of frogs, and there's a tree of bananas, and there's a tree of camels. And they don't go back to a common ancestor. Yes, there are family trees, thousands of them, but they're not connected. The fact that we see 1,100 varieties of apples now does not prove apples are related to whales. You guys are completely insane to believe such a thing. Haeckel became worried about the large gap between non-living and living. Yeah, you ought to be. So he invented one. It's called the Monera. You can look it up. He lied, okay? To have a complete chart, Haeckel decided to create a series of organisms. He called them Monera. 1869, he claimed to have discovered these organisms in ocean mud samples. He named them Bathybius Haeckeli in honor of Haeckel. Uh -huh. 1875, John Buchanan revealed Huxley, uh, Huxley, I'm sorry, Huxley, I've been saying Haeckel, Huxley. 
His discovery was simply calcium sulfate from seawater. Haeckel refused to admit his fraud and reprinted the Monera in the drawing of his book, The History of Creation. I think I've got that one in here. Judy, have you seen that one? Organizing the library. History of Creation. Okay. His fraud continued with his attempt to prove the only difference between man and ape is that man can speak. That's the only difference. He can see. Go to a zoo. <laughs> he fraudulently created a missing link called Pithecanthropus alalis, the speechless ape man. He went so far as to have artist Gabriel Marx draw the made-up creature. He lied, okay? Haeckel reached an all-time low when he began presenting his biogenetic law known as the law of recapitulation. He taught that each animal retraces the stages of evolution in its embryonic development. He drew a dog embryo at four weeks. This is his drawing that you said he was a great artist. This is the human embryo at four weeks. I'm sorry, there's the actual, uh, what they really look like. Here's his drawings. He's either a lousy artist or he's a liar. Those are not even similar to what they actually, he, he faked them to make them look alike. Here's the charts that you said is evidence for evolution. I'm sorry, you are mistaken. Are we still recording? Okay, okay. Uh, on top are Haeckel's drawings, underneath are actual photographs. He is a lousy artist or he's a really convincing liar. But to have you present that as evidence, 100 and what, uh, 60 years after it's proven wrong? It proves how convincing it was. And Mr. Nelson still thinks it's evidence for evolution. The gill slits. He was tried at the Jenna University court. He was convicted and he confessed. A small percentage of my drawings are forgeries. Those namely for which the observed material is so incomplete or insufficient as to fill in and reconstruct the missing links by hypothesis and comparative synthesis. Hoven translation. I didn't have any evidence so I made up what I wanted it to say. I made it what I wanted it to look like. That's what that means in English. He, should, he said, I should feel utterly condemned were it not that hundreds of the best observers and biologists lie under the same charge. So in 1875, he admitted it was a fraud. 145 years later, you are still believing it. James, get up to speed, okay? Despite its status as a fake, Haeckel continu Darwin continued to use this biogenetic law as the most important evidence of common descent. They would ask Darwin, what's the best evidence you've got? Oh, look at the embryos. Look at these drawings. Look at this chart. And people go, oh, wow, it must be true. You use the same thing tonight, James. I want the listeners to this channel to understand you either don't know what you're talking about or you're lying because you're presenting evidence that is false. It's not true. Stop using that. The whole purpose of this debate series, where's the evidence for evolution? That's not evidence. Human embryo at the very early period can hardly be distinguished from that of other members of the vertebrate kingdom, Darwin said. All these frauds brought to public an 1911 book called Haeckel's Frauds and Forgeries. So for over 110 years, it's been known he lied and published about it. Few people know the pictures were fakes. The deceit was exposed by Haeckel's Frauds and Forgeries, a book by Asmuth and Hull. They quoted 19 leading authorities, anatomist Keeble of Freiburg University, said, it clearly appears that Haeckel has in many cases freely invented embryos or reproduced from illustrations given by others in a substantially changed form. Zoologist at uh, Basel University said, it's a sin against scientific truthfulness. I agree. Now listen, I love science. Science is what we know. Knowledge gained by observation, experimentation, testing, demonstration. I love science. Evolution is not part of science. It's a religious worldview. You guys believe it on faith completely. Nobody's ever seen a cow produce a non-cow or a dog produce a non-dog or an amoeba produce a non-amoeba. It's not science. It's a religious belief you have, these stupid family trees. During early exposure, Western educators continue to use Haeckel's pictures for decades as proof of the theory of evolution. The matter's been settled with finality. Dr. Michael Richardson, an embryologist at St. George Medical School, London, he found there was no record that anyone actually ever checked Haeckel's claims by systematically comparing human and other fetuses during development. Let's check it out. Isn't that what science is supposed to do? Anybody can make a claim. Okay, check it. That's what peer review is all about. Okay, here's one of his peers, who's an embryologist, reviewing it. He assembled a scientific team that did that, photographing the growing embryos of 39 different species. In 1997, interview London's The Times, Richardson said, this is one of the worst cases of scientific fraud. It's shocking to find that somebody one thought was a great scientist was deliberately misleading. It makes me angry. What he, Haeckel, did was take a human embryo and copy it. 
pretending that the salamander and the pig and all the others look the same at the same stage. They don't. They are fakes. Check it out. London, the Times uh, from London, uh, what's that, 30 years ago, 20, 25 years ago. When we see at a certain stage the embryos of a man and the dog, ape and the uh, dog and the rabbit, the pig, the sheep, though recognizable as higher vertebrates, you can tell it's got a backbone, cannot be distinguished from each other. The fact can only be elucidated by assuming a common parentage. Haeckel's still teaching it himself 30 years after he was proven to be a liar. There's Haeckel's drawings. There's the actual photographs by Richardson who teaches embryology. He lied. Stop using that as evidence for evolution. Tear it out of all the textbooks. You teachers, go to your school board and say, folks, we got a textbook on page 87 here. It says this information, and this has been proven wrong for 100 years. Can we tear this page out, please? Come on, don't you want the textbooks to be accurate? Is that all you've got? Is that, I'm wound up tonight, man. Thank you, Matt. Uh, the biogenetic law as a proof for evolution is valueless. That's 60, 70 years ago they knew that, okay? Biogenetic law has become so deeply rooted in biological thought, it cannot be weeded out, in spite of having been demonstrated to be wrong by numerous scholars. Science Magazine, 1969, a peer-reviewed journal. Surely the biogenetic law is as dead as a doornail, American scientist, 35 years ago. Set of 19th century drawings still appear in reference books, are badly misdrawn, said the embryologist in Britain. Haeckel confessed to drawing from memory, was convicted of fraud at the University of Jena, and the drawings persist. St. George Medical School in London, 1997. Here's Haeckel's fake drawings used at universities all over the place, still using them. University of North Dakota, when I was there preaching, they still use Haeckel's drawings. There's an excellent book about the gill slits. Haeckel did, he faked his, or Darwin's book came out in 1859. He said, we, we, we should find evidence for my theory. Haeckel faked the drawings 10 years later, six years after that. Six professors proved he was wrong. He lied. Okay. It should have been over. Stop. Go look for more. If, if you want to believe in evolution, that's fine. But don't use false evidence to tell other people it's true. Where's the evidence? Those are not gill pouches. Holt Biology teaches it. Glencoe Biology teaches it. These are lying. Tim Barra still teaching it, 115 years after it's proven wrong. Kenneth Miller, the Catholic uh, biology teacher in Rhode Island, still teaching it, wrote it in his book. Kenneth Miller says evolution is as much a fact as gravity. Kenneth, I'll debate you any time. Bring it on, Catholic and all. Wear your rosary thing. I'll, I'll, doesn't matter. I'll take you on. You're wrong. These are not gill slits. One minute. One minute. The presence of gill slits and tails is the early stage of vertebrate embryos supports evidence from the fossil record. Those are not gill slits. They're lying. This is in books all over the place. All I've ever said is I don't, I'm not trying to get creation in the schools. I want the schools to be accurate. I'm going for uh, honesty. Stop using this lie as evidence for evolution. It's all over the place. I got hundreds of textbooks here. I believe science class should teach science. It is not science that the embryos are related. That was only one point, James. I got a whole list here. This debate's gonna go all night. Bring it on, your turn. <laughs> And that is time. Gentlemen, uh, we are only through the opening statements and it's already an epic debate. So I can already tell it's going to be one to remember. Uh, we've got a fantastic chat already. We've got uh, over 325 people and therefore I see a lot of questions coming in, guys. Just make sure you are tagging me. Uh, I've already got a lot of great questions for the Q&A, so I appreciate it. All right, James W., we are going to hand it over to you now that we move into the rebuttal portion of the debate. We have six minutes for the rebuttal. So whenever you're ready, James, go ahead. Well, you know, Kent, I don't know where you would ever get the idea that I had watched Aaron Ra's stuff because, I mean, here we have Aaron Ra looking for fossils, and he says they definitely count as evidence for evolution. And I would go with him any day over someone hand-waving away an entire field of evidence. And, you know, I see that you decided to disregard my warning and, you know, breach that ninth commandment in terms of Haeckel, but that's fine. You know, how, how's that going to work for you on Judgment Day? I guess God's going to, you might not be too happy with that. But, you know, they took Nebraska man out of the textbook. It's funny that they, uh, why would they leave in Haeckel's drawings if they were proven to be fraudulent? They have no problem taking out things that are later proven not to be true. And, and you mentioned that CO2 and oxygen exist, and there's a relationship between plants and animals. And that is life use, utilizing resources available to it. That's what you exactly what you would expect from evolution. And what you said about uh, 
abortion and 28 days old. I don't know of anybody who's seriously considering that. There were a, a couple, there are a couple people on the fringes, but I don't think anybody has ever used evolution as a reason to uh, support abortion one way or the other. It just never comes up in that sphere. And uh, yeah, the biogenetic law is not even relevant anymore what we're talking about we're not talking about the biogenetic law being fact we're talking about the fact that the embryos look similar i see you have those distorted photographs and that's fine that's uh that they tried to make look similar because hey you guys don't have any evidence for god so when we present evidence of common ancestry that kind of gets people a little makes them a little nervous maybe they're not going to live forever maybe death does apply to them so they'll do anything to escape that reality but I guess it, it helps for a time being. But like I was saying before, we have evidence of feathers emerging in the fossil record on birds. God got the days wrong, the, the creation order wrong, because reptiles came first. Birds lay eggs like reptiles, and they also have reptilian scales on their feet. And chickens have been found to express teeth, not serrated beaks like we see with some birds, actual Teeth. Now, why would an intelligent designer put teeth in the genetics of a chicken or other birds when they don't have teeth? Why is that there? And moving forward, we have human evolution. We have the Australopithecines, Australopithecus afarensis, 2.9 million years ago. Australopithecus africanus, 2 million years ago. Homo habilis, 2.8 million years ago. You'll notice that's an overlap. They both existed at the same time, we have Homo erectus 2 million years ago. Homo ergaster, about 1.3 to 1.8 million years ago, the first hominid to use fire and, uh, and to construct tools. Homo heidelbergensis, 700,000 years ago, arose Homo florensis, only found uh, in Indonesia in the South Pacific, leading up to Homo neanderthalus and, of course, us Homo sapiens. Now, there are people who have devoted years, decades of scientific study to examining these, the remnants we have. And I've seen people on YouTube go bone by bone over these human ancestors with creationists and demonstrate that these are clearly not apes. They are not modern apes. And they are also not humans. They are transitional species. And of course, the response to that is no hand wave that away they're not and i get that's a little hard on the religion that uh we find all these animals in the fossil record that do not exist today why would that be uh, um and i think what's what's going on here is that we're, we're missing a lack of scale so like i said before lucy australopithecus afarensis lived about 2.9 million years ago and that is being a hu pre-human ancestor. All of human history accounts for about 250 generations. You go back 250 generations, you're at the dawn of history. That would have been about 128,000 generations ago. As well, I know that's way longer than you think the Earth has been here, but these people did live and they did exist. And the fossil record bears proof of that. You can disregard them if you want, but they are your ancestors. Their blood runs through your veins. And the fact that they fought and lived and reproduced and were able to have kids that live is the only reason you're able to live today. And you have kids that live. And uh, you, you can dismiss them if you want, but it's, it's not reality. I'm sorry, these, these animals do exist. And if you just want to pretend they don't, that's fine. But 128,000 generations, at no point during that time did any animal ever change into a different kind. That would be a lateral jump on the evolutionary tree. All we ever see is further diversification. That's all we've ever seen. And at no point did one animal give birth to another kind. You can't draw the line at species at one particular generation. That's just not how it works. And that, you could go a hundred generations before a hundred, even a thousand, and you're never going to notice any major changes. But if you look at the grand scheme of things, you are going to see major changes. And that's the power of time. I know you like to say that we think time, it's reality. Time does tiny changes accumulating in the short term 
add up to very big changes in the long term. And you take animals that are the most distantly related, like apples and whales, and use that as an example after a billion years of diversification in each way, okay. but uh, they are related. Thank you. If, if you want to wrap up your thoughts, James W., no worries. No, no, go ahead. We can, okay. we can move on. Well, thank you for that uh, six minute uninterrupted rebuttal. We are now going to hand it over to Kent for equal time. Uh, Kent, whenever you're ready, you, you also have uh, six minutes. Well, thank you, sir. Here's the Miami standard. Is this today? Uh, seven, seven days, days ago, ago, March 9th. There you go. Can you zoom in on, over this way, over this way? Okay, right in front of my face. Got it. Miami standard. It says, can't focus on it here. There we go. Uh, I'll just read it to you. Okay. Miami Standard, published March 9, 2022, the Miami Standard. Proposed law in Maryland would allow mothers to kill their babies up to 28 days after birth. There are several states considering laws like that. Now, James, you rattled off a bunch of R and Ra's evidence again. I'll debate you and him both same time. Okay, bring him down and I'll take you on. But this time, James, you moderate it and no interrupting. I didn't interrupt you at all. And one topic at a time, okay? You brought up about five topics. You brought up Homo erectus and Homo habilis and all the homos. Never mind. Uh, so <laughs> you said they're not apes and they're not humans. They're intermediate. Look, if you find a Homo that is halfway, that looks like halfway ape and halfway human, that doesn't prove anything. And there is no fossil record, James. There's a lot of fossils. We got a whole museum full of them here. There's a lot of fossils. They're evidence of rapid burial. You say they're evidence they had parents. Well, duh. It's not evidence they had children. That's what I've been saying all along. You find a fossil in the dirt, you can't prove it had any kids at all. Sure, you can prove it had parents, duh. I didn't say that. I've never said that. This clam petrified in the closed position. These are found by the thousands, maybe even the tens of thousands, on top of mountain ranges all over the world, like Mount Everest, covered in petrified closed clams. Had to be buried alive, had to be buried quickly. It clams open when they die. So I think this is, this is a fossil. I think it had parents. I would agree with that. I bet they were clams. But I cannot prove it had any children, and I certainly cannot prove it had children that were different. Neither can you. You can't prove any fossil that in any museum in the world had children that lived. You cannot prove they had children that lived that were different. No animal today produces children that are different enough to be considered a part of evolution. Where is it happening today? It doesn't happen. There is no fossil record. You mentioned a bunch of things here. I'd love to get them all, but we need to go for six years on this debate. Let's see. 1646, enter. You mentioned the whale as evidence for evolution. That's why James and uh, Donnie, I like to do one topic at a time. What's your evidence? Give me just one instead of rattling off six or eight. I don't have time to answer them all, okay? I got them all in my seminar series, Lies in the Textbooks, video number four on here. I'll send you one, James, if you really want to know the truth, if you can handle the truth. Whales, for example, have bones located in the muscles of their body walls that are vestigial bones of hips and hind limbs. Really. Many organisms retain traces of their evolutionary history. For example, the whale retains pelvic and leg bones as useless vestiges. Biology textbook on the shelf. Uh, Jeannie Scott, the National Center for Science Misdirection, says, working to defend the teaching of evolution against sectarian attack. I debated Jeannie once. Jeannie, any time, bring it on. Okay, I'll take you on again. You and all your whole staff. Bring Skip. I want to see Skip again. Okay. Uh, this is their evidence for evolution. A whale, a bossy to blowhole. The cow changed to a whale. You realize the nose has to go from the front to the back of the head. Is it going to go right through the optic nerve, which goes to the eyes? Is it going to rearrange the whole breathing apparatus to put the nose on top of the head? Stop and think. We don't see it happening. But they say their evidence is a whale used to have legs. This is proof it used to walk on land. True, there's some fish today that are able to crawl out on land and crawl back in. I agree. Maybe they're designed to do that. You know, there are some cars that are designed to take off and fly. You ever seen those little bitty cars? You drive it or you can fly it. Well, not many of them, but somebody designed it. Somebody might have designed Tiktaalik and all these other ones to do exactly what they do. Many modern whales have hind limb bones that are no function. This is an absolute lie. Just imagine whales walking around. It's true. Here's the bones they're talking about right here. Los Angeles Museum of Natural History said this is a whale's pelvis. This is a, either the guy who did this is a liar or he's stupid about whale anatomy. Tell him I said so, and I'll debate him too. The whole university staff or the museum staff, killer whale located at Cambridge University, Cambridge uh, University, says the whale has a vestigial pelvis. Here's Milwaukee, humpback whale hanging up there. Yep. 
Well, I agree. They've got these bones there, but it's not vestigial hind legs. And you know that, James, if you studied my stuff at all, get, get evidence for evolution. National Pornographic for kids said millions of years ago, dolphins had legs. No, they did not. Okay. The whale's pelvis located far from the vertebrate has no apparent function. Tell the whole biology teacher, I don't know who wrote this one. I forgot the author's name. You tell them, I said they're stupid or they're lying, okay? Those bones, we got one in our museum. These little bones are anchor points for whales to reproduce. Whales, male whale has a penis 15 feet long. He's got to have special muscles. They have to mate in the dark, underwater, with no arms, and he can't talk and say, screw it over, honey. They have muscles to maneuver their penis into position. It has nothing to do with walking on land, okay? It has to do with making baby whales. What do you mean they serve no function? Study your anatomy. Male and female whales are vastly different. They have to be. Duh, male and female humans are different too. Viva la difference, okay? Yay. The erotic endurance of whale. They have known forever these are not vestigial leg bones. They are bones used in mating. They serve no function. Tell that to daddy whale. He'll slap you upside the head, okay? One minute. Fish have, fish have strong muscles on their sides that allow them to swim tail side to side. I agree. Many have side to side movement. Some have up and down movement like the whale. So... These whales, are there's no vestigial hip bones in a whale or a snake. Snakes can't talk either, except one was given the miraculous ability to talk in the Bible, but I'm not demanding that be taught in the schools. I believe that by faith. But snakes have little claws. The same thing, they're for mating. They're not for proof for walking on land. Guys, back to the topic of the debate. James, where's the evidence for evolution? Don't give me a homo, and don't give me a, a whale, and don't tell me about gill slits. Where's the evidence for evolution? Start over. Go ahead. Your turn. Okay, just on time. That concludes the uninterrupted six-minute rebuttals. Again, fantastic debate so far. We got a ton of great points to discuss. And so now that we're in the discussion, let's do this, James. We're going to allow you to start. Pick uh, one of your uh, lines of evidence that you brought up in uh, the opening statement and uh, rebuttals. We'll allow you to start and we'll kind of uh, engage each one, uh, one by one. Oh, apologies, James, let me uh, unmute you. So I can and... ask Kent a question. I think question and answer period. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. All right, sounds good. So Kent, the first thing I wanna, did the greyhound come from a non-greyhound? We, we did Kent, you can't come from a non-Kent, but did the greyhound come from a non-greyhound? Well, I don't know. They've developed quite a few varieties of dogs over the years, mostly by selective breeding to get a particular purpose, like a fast dog or a small dog or a hairy dog. They're all still dog, though. I'd be willing to bet a million dollars the greyhound came from a dog. So somewhere along the line, there were dogs that were not greyhounds that stopped having non-greyhound babies, and then they decided to start having greyhound babies that no. are greyhounds? No, no, there, oh, were, no. There, were, there were dogs that had babies that turned out to be dogs. Some are uh, bigger, and we chose but, to give it a name, Greyhound. I don't think the Greyhound cares what we call it or even knows what we call it, okay? But I think the Greyhound is still a dog, and I think it came from parents that were dogs and probably even grandparents that were dogs. I'd even go back five or six generations, if you'd like. They were dogs all the way back. And I'd be willing to bet 50 bucks if the Greyhound has puppies, they'll be dogs too. Right. They'll be Greyhounds forever. But at some point, no, they no, were no, not no, Greyhounds. No. Greyhounds might, greyhounds might change enough to where we decide to call it oh. a new name, but it'll still be a dog. So if we isolated a population for, say, 20,000 years, they probably wouldn't be able to interbreed, would they? Oh, could be. A man might decide that's the criteria to call it a new species. Again, I don't think the dogs care. I think the greyhound and the chihuahua would have a tough time producing babies, but they'd still be dog. So the varieties of dog kind have been created by man, most of them. Nature would select some to survive. Turn all the dogs in the world loose in Alaska, only the hairy ones survive. Turn them loose in Australia outback, only the greyhound type survive. Nature does select, but it doesn't create anything. It's still a dog. Go ahead. You can have uh, Kent ask a question, Don. Okay. Would you answer my question about the gill slits? I think I showed you plenty of sure. evidence. It has been proven wrong. Why are you still thinking Haeckel's drawings our evidence for evolution. Why would you present that tonight in 2022? I don't think they've been proven wrong, Kent. I do think that it's very unusual that why would the human why would the human embryo have these arches in their neck if we weren't related to them? And I get it that they don't turn into gills in humans, but that's how that's how biology works. It takes similar base structures and does different things with them because evolution can only work with what it has. It can't 
invent something out of nothing. It takes existing structures and it can do different things with them. It can make glands in the throat, bones in the ears, but in fish it can make gills. As the baby develops inside the mother, it starts off really, really tiny. Two cells, okay? The only cell you can actually see without a microscope maybe is the egg cell, the sperm you can't see without a good microscope. They get together and make a baby start to develop an embryo. And when it starts off, it's round. The whole thing is round, no slits anywhere. But we know part of those are gonna turn into lungs, part of it's gonna turn into a mouth, <coughs> which are necessary for breathing. So later, as it grows and develops, these little wrinkles of develop in the skin under the chin, and they grow into bones in the ear and glands in the throat. My point is, they are not gill slits, they're not gills. The fact that they have these little wrinkles under their chin, and some other animals seem to have them, well, I showed you the drawings, actual photographs by the guy who's an embryologist at a, a professional university, and that's his job. On top are his Haeckel's fake drawings, which you use tonight. Underneath are actual photographs from uh, 1998. So, so what? They've got little folds of skin. I got some in my elbow right here. I've seen fat folks got 20 or 30 of them on their belly. They can't breathe through them, okay? You're, you're mistaken. I'm sorry, James. Correct yourself. Tell Aaron. Quit feeding you false information. Where's the evidence for evolution? Not the gill slits. You used fake drawings tonight, proven wrong 150 years ago. Well, Kent, I, uh, I don't know what to tell you. I guess when you get to the judgment day, you'll find out. Okay, well, uh, say, James, simple. Say, I'm sorry. I'll stop using that. Let me say it for you and you can sign um, it. If you want to stop uh, breaching the ninth commandment and slandering Haeckel, then, I mean, that's up to you. But you believe in a God. I don't. Okay. Well, you will one day, but uh, okay. So my question to you was, why do you use these fake drawings? I think I give plenty of evidence. Check it out. Uh, University of, uh, let's see, I, I showed you the paid. evidence right here. Uh, Richardson, let's see, American Scientist, 1998, said they're fake. Okay. Uh, New Scientist Magazine, 1997, said they're fake. They, they said he was convicted of fraud. You're still using them. Stop. It's real simple, James. Say, I'm sorry, I won't use those anymore. I don't think he was convicted of fraud, but... You don't think he was convicted of a fraud? I haven't seen any evidence of that other than what people say. I haven't seen any documents. I haven't seen any hey, transcripts, any Matt. trial records. Okay, Google, Google New Scientist, right there. September 6, 1997. Or you can Google this one, American Scientist, 1988, where they say it's dead as a doornail. It's not true. The biogenetic or, uh, law. Science Magazine, 1969. Not the, the, not the similarities in the embryos. Instead. Okay, go ahead. Well, if if Aaron Ra's right, he's right. Why would uh, oh, why would that be an if issue? He's, if he's if he's right, he's right. I agree. And if, if he ever turns out to be right on something, I'll agree with him. So, Ken, I have to ask you. So, a lot of these whale pelvises. Now, you've done extensive studies on the whale reproductive system, and you commented on that tonight. And they're 15 foot penises and that these are muscle point attachments but these these some of these pelvises have ball and socket joints so why would a uh why would it need a ball and socket joint just for muscle attachments maybe it has to swivel around but are you married they're locked in i'm not i'm divorced kent okay we're in the same boat okay it's uh yeah anyway so i don't know I haven't watched, nobody has ever actually watched whales reproduce. They do it way down deep and they close the curtains, I guess. Nobody knows. But we know they have babies because they come up pregnant. And so maybe there's special reasons why they have a ball and socket joint, but it doesn't prove it was a leg. Well, in terms of science, we're not talking about proof. We're talking about what's reasonable to assume. Is it reasonable to assume that a god would make it look like it was used at one point for walking on land. And the fact that it's there is no problem for evolution. If it retains a residual function, we would expect that, right? Because if they could make more babies, that that trait would be disappeared from the gene pool. So, of course, if it's necessary, which I'm not saying it is, but if it was, evolution is totally fine with that. Would it also be reasonable to assume, like, wow, this is a really good design. Makes these monster creatures able to make babies underwater in the dark and can't talk. Wow, that's a good design. Would that be a reasonable conclusion from the fact that they look uh, like they're designed? Well, that's an interpretive. We, they don't look like they're designed. They look like they're just there so that the whales can be whales. And it looks like 
And the fossil evidence record proves that, as I said before, Aaron Ra's gone on fossil digs and digs bones out of the dirt. And we find animals that we've never seen before don't exist today. They're not like anything that exists today. And uh, what's the explanation for that? Why are these layers, why are these fossils so beautifully sorted in this order all over the world? Uh, when, when your explanation is this global flood that would have mixed everything up, everything would be in a jumbled mess. That's not what we find anywhere. We find the same layers all over the world. And no, you can't see them all, but at one spot, there are some spots where you can see a lot of them. But if you take a, a map, a uh, what's geological map, you can find out which layers are exposed in any one place. And you can go there and you can look at it. It'll be the same all over the world. I have, I have done that. I've gone fossil hunting. We have a giant fossil collection here. I've been to, let's see, 37 countries in my traveling and speaking. I'd always look for fossils from that area. I've seen the Grand Canyon up and down. They told me when we were down in the Grand Canyon in a helicopter, they said, you go back 200 million years. I looked yeah. at my watch. It was the same date when I was at the bottom than it was when I was at the top. I didn't go back at all. Actually, I went forward about a half hour for the helicopter trip. They're lying to you. There's no geologic column. It's a bunch of layers that formed in the flood. And the fact that animals are found in certain layers <coughs> is, a, is hydrologic sorting. Of course, it's going to sort them by, by body density. This thing will automatically make 10 or 15 layers if we watch it for a few minutes. The, the Noah's flood formed nearly all of the fossils. Fossils aren't forming today. Show me where fossils are forming in any significant number today. There are trillions of fossils in the ground. Nobody is seeing them form. A lot of animals died today. There's probably 30 deer got hit on the roads out here in the last six months. None of them are going to fossilize. None. We have fossils by the trillions. They had to be buried like Noah's. Would that be evidence of Noah's flood for you, James? Is that enough evidence? No, for... no it wouldn't, Kent. It would be okay. evidence of a long period of time where we okay. know that the odds of fossilization are probably well under 1%, probably a, right. a hundredth or a thousandth of a percent. So the fact that we have billions or maybe even trillions of fossils is a testament to how long this process has been going on. It's a long time. And you could go through and you could go down to the bottom of Grand Canyon and you are hand waving away creatures that lived and existed on this earth millions of years before you did. And uh, you're doing that so you can cling to this Bronze Age fable about, I hate to break this, you can't, you can't, you're not going to live forever. I'm not. We're all, we're all going to die one day, and that is yeah. terrible. But it doesn't mean it's good to engage in delusion and fantasy, pretending that doesn't apply to us. Well, uh, again, we've got 30, 13 topics going at the same time here, one at a time. The vestigial structures... Uh, well, the fossils, okay? There are no, there is no fossil record. Somebody's putting their information, their date on them. When you find any fossil, you will notice two things immediately. It doesn't talk and there's no date on it. None, not a single fossil. None of the homos they found have a date on them and none of them can talk, okay? So they, if they, they put their interpretation on them. I can assign and say, wow, this is intermediate between a baseball and a, Soccer ball. Look at that. It's forming the round shape. I can make any story up I want. Evolution is a fairy tale for grown-ups. Nobody's ever seen any clam produce a non-clam. Nobody's ever seen a greyhound produce anything other than a dog. And nobody's ever produced a greyhound from anything other than a dog. Tell you what, selectively breed your pine trees till you get a dog. Let's try that, okay? Or selectively breed your amoeba until you get a dog. That's what you guys claim happened. You got these family trees of the amoeba turning into the dog and the human and the whale and the clam and everything else. It's a bunch of lines on paper. It's not science. Mr. Aaron goes fossil hunting. So, yay. Tell him he can send some to our museum if you find some cool ones. We got hundreds, probably thousands of them here. I like fossils. They're evidence of rapid burial. And you said the fact that we have so many fossils is evidence of long period of time. The other obvious way to look at it is it's evidence of a flood. Why can't you, the Bible says, the Bible describes, I'm going to put your name, James, in 2 Peter chapter 3. It says there would be scoffers who would be willingly ignorant of the creation and the flood. The fact that we find all these fossils, what about trees that are found petrified, standing up, running through all these layers? You're claiming the layers are different ages. You've got petrified trees connecting them all. Those layers formed within 6, 10, 12 months of each other in a big flood. See the tide going up and down during the flood? 
uninterrupted would cause thousands of layers to be settled out in one year. You need to come take the tour of Dinosaur Adventure Land, James. Okay, go ahead. Well, can't like we've dealt with these polystrate fossils before. They're the way they form is well understood. It's not in any way a threat to evolution. We we know what they are, and and the fossil record is a record because you can't really honestly expect a global flood to sort all the animals all over the world in the same way. You can't find one example of where there's a fossil where it couldn't be on the evolutionary perspective. And yeah, we understand how polystrate fossils form. It's usually due to local, local floods, not worldwide floods. And we also have this iridium layer all over the world. And how does that form in a flood? I know you think that maybe God, the dome fell, that uh, the ice canopy, uh, the Hoban theory, maybe that happened. But how's that getting a layer of iridium all over the world if it all hit the ocean? And we know that iridium is found mostly off the planet in meteorites. And yet we have this layer all over the world, radiocarbon date, or I'm sorry, not radiocarbon dated, but using potassium argon or rubidium strontium dating that dates to when the dinosaurs when extinct, and you will not find Kent one, not even one example, Kent, of a dinosaur fossil above that layer, not even one that the flood misplaced and maybe a Jackson chame chameleon got thrown up there, you know, after it had lived in the garden for a thousand years and became a dinosaur. But that doesn't happen anywhere, which we would expect if this global flood had happened, everything would be chaotic. Floods do not happen in a nice, neat, linear, organized way. Well, Donnie, we need to follow the rules here, one topic at a time. I'm not sure which one he wants me to answer. He just brought up six, okay? But uh, the polystrata trees, okay? Poly meaning many, strata meaning layers, okay? The uh, <coughs> Mary Lee Creek, uh, Mary Lee and the Blue Creek formation of coal, a friend of mine worked there, said, Brother Hovind, we find petrified trees standing up all the time, sticking up out of the coal or down into the coal. They found fossil letter H here, went from the Mary Lee down several layers, the Blue Creek formation had fossil B coming out of the Blue Creek, going up several layers. Uh, these petrified trees, all the, both layers of coal had to form at the same similar times before the tree would rot, certainly within a couple years of each other. It's much more logical and rational to deduce, wow, the Blue Creek formation of coal and the Mary Lee formation of coal formed quickly. I think an honest court of law would quickly say, wow, you're right, there's the evidence. We got fossils going through the same layer coming out of different seams of coal. There are petrified trees, the specimen ridge in Yellowstone, Wyoming, I've been there a couple of times. Broken roots extend through so many layers. They didn't grow there. 30 foot petrified tree in Tennessee, Cookville, Tennessee, I preached up there. They got one going through a seam of coal here and a different seam of coal at the top. You guys would claim each seam of coal is a different age. I would say no. Each seam of coal is maybe a different tide. As the tide's going up and down, washing the stuff back and forth, it's going to lay out layers of uh, vegetation that are going to turn to coal. But there are 30 consecutive layers of coal in some places. One place in Wyoming, they're 300 feet thick. Pure coal. That's a lot of coal. Coal seams nearly always found on layers of clay and rock. This would be poor soil to support a forest. How do you get this tree growing out of clay or rock? growing through a seam of coal. The Joggins, Nova Scotia is famous for its petrified fossils of trees standing up. Hundreds of them all up and down the coast. Joggins, Nova Scotia, Google it. The, I think you guys are mistaken to claim the layers are different ages. And I think it's probably criminal to force kids to learn that in school, that these layers are different ages. If you, you guys claim the top layer is younger. I've never had an evolutionist answer this question. If the top layer is younger, where did it come from? Is it coming from outer space? Moving it from here to here is not, is not changing the age of it. You guys claim the older, the lo lower layers are older, the top layer is younger. Stop and think about that. If I shuffle my deck of cards here, is the top card younger? All the layers are the same age, James. They were shuffled around in a flood. That's it. Wow, look at that. Two of hearts is younger than the ace of hearts. Wow. I bet I could change that, hurry. Let's see. Oh, now the Ace of Diamonds is the youngest. It's on top. It is so dumb to see grown men believe such a dumb thing that the layers are different ages when there's evidence showing clearly they can't be. 
There's a whale found fossilized. I think I got a picture of it here, standing on its nose. The nose is in a totally different layer. It is right there. The nose is in a layer of rock dated a million years older than the rest of the body. It balanced there for a million years on its, on its nose, a whale no less, till the layers formed around it. This is insane. You should stop believing that stuff, James. Give your heart back. You said you studied and turned away from Christianity. Well, you went the wrong direction. Turn around, come back. Okay, go ahead. Well, like I said, Kent, we understand how polystrate fossils form. We understand. That's well understood. Well, explain and it to me. Explain it to me. I don't understand. Local explain floods, this local local floods, floods that disrupt sediment that allow for something like that to happen. What you can't explain is something like Specimen Ridge. I'm surprised you brought that up, Kent, because they have 27 layers of forest with a layer of volcanic ash in between. You would almost think, Kent, that there were 27 volcanic eruptions and then a forest grew on top of it. And yeah, the roots go down and they can penetrate multiple layers. Nobody's disagreeing with that. Doesn't mean the layers aren't there. And we're not, this is not a court of law. And in courts of law, at times, as you know, evidence can be excluded. Valid evidence can be excluded. But um, we get feedback. Okay. Valid evidence can be, be excluded because people's uh, rights were violated, but we don't have that in the scientific community. We consider all available evidence. We consider the fact that there's 27 layers and that the dendrochronology of these layers show that the oldest trees in these layers were 500 years old. And we know that it takes at least a couple hundred years after these layers form for any growth to be able to happen. So you're, you're talking at least 30,000 years. It's obviously on a much larger scale, but being the most generous possible to you and your 6,000 year theory, uh, you need like four or five times more that length to uh, account for that. We, we just don't see that. We have no evidence of this global flood. You didn't, you didn't answer how this iridium layer formed all over the planet, Kent, from a global flood. How is it in the same exact spot when this water would be assuaging and back and forth, this iridium would be scattered throughout this tumultuous event, but yet we see it nice and neatly in the same layer. And if you found a dinosaur above that, you would win, you could win a Nobel Prize. And if you found a dinosaur above that iridium layer, which we have never, ever seen, not even one <laughs> example of a dinosaur above this iridium layer. And that that's very hard on your, uh, your 6,000 year of theory. But, uh, yeah. Okay, let me, I'm, I'm going to jump in here real quick. And Dr. Hoven, we're going to give you the, the chance to respond. We're doing a great job at keeping it equally timed. We do have about three or four different topics going right now. So we'll allow Kent to respond to it. It's the nature. I understand. Uh, no worries. I'm, it's I'm the, trying to give him equal time. So if I. Oh, I'm, yeah. It, it's, it's been great. It's, it's been okay. great in terms of equally timed. So I'm let's, not trying to uh, over talk him. <laughs> no worries. You guys are doing great. Uh, Dr. Dino, if you want to address his, his last couple points there, and then maybe we should shift our focus back to specifically uh, evidence for evolution. Although the fossil, I, I, it, it, a lot of overlap, I understand. So I uh, can't go ahead. We'll hand it go to ahead, you. Yeah, yeah. One of the rules is equal time. And thank you, Donnie. The other one was one topic at a time. We got, he keeps asking, why didn't you answer my iridium? Well, you asked eight questions. I chose a different one to answer. Okay. Now, that you guys claim that the, you guys tried to portray that the Noah's flood was turbulent. Let's see, what were the words you used? It was tumultuous, raging back and forth. You know, there are storms going on in the world right now, and we don't feel a thing here in Lenox, Alabama. There's hurricanes that hit, hit Gulf Coast of Florida, and they don't feel it in China. It's a big world, James, okay? So Noah might have been in a part of the flood that was peaceful the whole time. The, fight, the tide going up and down, pulled by the moon, is going to automatically create lots of turbulence underneath, down deep, Ocean-going ships today sail smoothly across the ocean while the tide raises them up and down, and they don't feel what's going on underneath, but it's happening. Underwater turbidity currents, it's happening all the time. So I think that the, the only way we can get so many fossils is to rapidly kill everything like Noah's flood would do and bury them quickly. We don't see fossils forming anywhere in any great, now I'm not aware of any fossils forming in, in, in Alabama in the last 50 years. If so, show me some. Hey, we buried, Steve, you buried that big pig out there, right, that died? We got to see if he fossilized. He's been buried, what, two years now? The big pig's been out there buried for two or three years? Let's dig him up, see if he fossilized. Okay, yeah. I don't think you can find it. So if you want to talk about fossilization, as far as iridium layers, there's lots of stuff. But Answers in Genesis has a great answer about that. 
uh, on their website, AIG.org. You can check that out. Or ICR has another one, Institute for Creation Research. But that's a whole debate on itself. You want to talk about iridium and meteorites, we can do that. But one topic at a time. So I'm, I, I'm standing by my position. Fossils are found by the trillions. You cannot prove any of them had children. You cannot prove any of them had children that lived. You twisted it and changed it to say, well, we know they had parents. That wasn't the point, James. Did the fossils have children? How would you prove any fossil had children that lived? How would you prove that? We can't prove that, Kent, but like I said, we know, we know that they were from, they were close to a, popu a breeding population of that species, right? Because like I said, we know that they had parents, Kent, and we know that their parents were very similar to them, but we know that they possessed a few select mutations that their parents did not have, and we see that today. You've got three kids, Ken. I have a son. They are not exact copies of you, as we heard last debate uh, with uh, Tom Jump. Kents do not produce Kents. Kents produce non-Kents. And while those are small changes, Kent, over the long term, when you extrapolate that out, when you make the reasonable, logical inferences that are, and uh, I realize you think the Earth's only 6,000 years old, 99.9% .9 of the scientists would say that's ludicrous, but you know, you're welcome to hold that position. We have freedom of thought. Well, I support freedom of thought. I, I don't think uh, religion has always thought that way. But um, no, they're not large scale fossils forming today because the conditions required for fossilization are incredibly rare, incredibly rare. They like I less than uh, probably a hundredth of a percent of animals that ever lived are fossilized. That means can, there are probably millions of species that lived on earth that will never be found in the fossil record because it's so rare. And, you know, you're talking about things, you claim that you've got fossilized pickles and acorns in your, in your creation museum. And we know that those are not really fossilized. Those are mineral accretions that accumulate on the out. They're not real fossils. Nobody would agree with that, but you've been promoting them to, um, rely on this hypothesis of rapid fossilization that we could have all these fossils in 6,000 years. And it's just not unfortunately concordant with reality. That's not what we see. And uh, like I said, we know that your ancestors, my ancestors, they all lived long enough to breed. We know that they had children that lived that they were able to take care of those children. You, you have kids, Kent, you know how hard it is to take care of a child and your ancestors, every single one of them can't, did that, and uh, otherwise you wouldn't be here. And uh, I think you owe them a little bit of gratitude. Go ahead. Hey, let me jump in here, gentlemen. Um, we're going to hand it to Kent for a final uh, thought, I guess. Of course, uh, Dr. Dono, Dino, you want to respond to these points. Uh, but that is the, the end of the discussion. So we're going to let Kent respond. James, since you started the discussion, we'll give Kent the final word on the discussion. But then, James, if there's anything you want to respond to, sure. of course, you still have your five-minute closing. So we'll save sure. that for okay. closings just to stay to form. Okay, quiet. well... You have uh, studied Mr. Nelson carefully, no question. Uh, you followed somebody who is confused or lying about this. You throw out these numbers like, wow, 99.9% .9 of scientists would disagree. That sounds like something Mr. Nelson would say. Uh, you don't know that. When they do studies and surveys, they found a large percentage of scientists, and by, by who gets to decide who's a scientist, in your mind, if you don't believe evolution, you're not a scientist, therefore all scientists believe in evolution. Oh. How about if I say, if you don't live in Alabama, you're not an American? Right. Come on. Who's deciding this? Okay. So it's not true that 99.9% .9 of scientists believe in evolution. That is not true. Okay. Secondly, you said a one, one hundredth of 1% 1 have fossilized. Where do you make up that number from? Draw it out of the air. No fossils are forming today, but we find trillions of fossils. There's a clam bed in Tennessee, 10 feet thick. Millions of petrified clams in the closed position. It goes for several miles. You can go dig out all you want. Petrified clams in the closed position are found on top of Mount Everest. Several thousand foot layer of petrified sea life on top of Mount Everest. When they climbed the mountains in Peru, South America, two miles above sea level, they found 500 fossilized oysters closed, all of them bigger than the world's record living oyster today. They found one 11 feet. They find fossils of beavers, eight feet long. <coughs> Biggest beaver in the world today is two and a half feet. They find fossil dragonflies over two foot wingspan. 
that's, there's nothing like that today. Fossils are usually much larger than their counterparts today. I think that's indication of what the Bible says as being exactly true, that before the flood came, everything lived longer. Before the flood came, people lived to be 900, according to the Bible. I think that's evidence, that's indication at least. Hey, maybe that book is true. It's not a sheep herder's girdle, uh, 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 God, Bible. Uh, uh, it's, a, it's a book written by God through different men. He chose to write it. You're going to believe that one day. But there's petrified firewood in Arizona, World Explorer magazine, a mummified dog stuck in a tree. Some would call it fossilized. This is actually a petrified cowboy boot with a cowboy's leg still in it. Fossilized fish giving birth. How long does it take to fossilize? Well, how long does it take to give birth? Not long. Petrified cowboy hat found in, or New, bowler's hat found in New Zealand. There's my pickle in the jar. We got it in the museum over here. It is fossilized. Don't say it's just the outside coating mineralized. No, the whole thing is solid through and through. Anyway, we can get on fossilization. Again, we got 20 topics going. You said the odds of fossilization are very low. Not if it's buried in mud quickly. If the odds of it happening are very low, which is true, but yet we find trillions of them, some event like Noah's flood must have done them all at one time. The, uh, you think so? Yeah. I'm, I'm, I think that's the logical conclusion from the fact that there are trillions of fossils and, and some giving birth to a baby. This had to take place rapidly. I don't see how you guys can't see it. Go ahead. We got a Q&A okay. section, right, Donnie? That's right. That's right. So I appreciate it, uh, gentlemen. We do have uh, f up to five minute concluding statements. If you, uh, if you gentlemen want to uh, wrap up your thoughts as I organize the questions here. So James, uh, that does conclude the uh, open discussion. Fantastic uh, job, Kent and James W. Great job keeping it equally timed. Uh, a lot of people enjoying this debate. We got uh, 442 people live uh, watching this epic showdown. So uh, James, we're going to hand it to you. You got uh, a five minute concluding statement to be fair if there's anything you want Thank to respond you, to there you got five minutes kent you'll get five minutes then we'll get through a couple uh, audience questions so go ahead so i would just like to ask uh kent if since he obviously has a lot of beef against ard Ra, if you would like to uh take R and Ra's phylogeny challenge where you look at the evolutionary tree of life and you tell us where it breaks down you tell us you point out things that you think that evolution says are related but you think are separate created kinds and that's the issue is that they can't produce a model because anytime they would, it would be shot down immediately because kind is so vague and nebulous that it can mean whatever it has to mean for, for them at, at any given time. And yeah, we don't know that there's no fossils being formed today. We don't know that. And lots of fossils being found is evidence of deep time, especially considering we have absolutely no evidence for this flood other than the fact that a book says a thing, the same book that talks about talking snakes, talking donkeys and deities instructing people to cook their food with human feces. If you think that's a reliable text and you want to and that's what you want to hang your reality on, you're like I said, you're welcome to do that. But don't expect us to think that's rational. And uh, yeah, the fact that we find strange fossils that are not alive today that are distinct from animals, any animals that we have today is evidence that life changes over time. And I think you admit to that, but you think there's some type of arbitrary limit like God, you know, how does that work, Kent? Is God coming inside the cell like Gandalf when it mutates enough to the limit and says, you shall not mutate. And the cells, of course, obey God. They stop mutating. Where, where are these arbitrary limits that you see? And how do we classify species? Uh, as we've said before, the, you talk about whether they are able to bring forth, but you've even said, well, you know, uh, if that's not the case, we could bring in a bunch of five-year-olds and see what they think. And maybe a group of five-year-olds knows more than modern biologists who have studied decades, studied this topic for decades in the laboratory, in the field. But you want to tell us that, no, 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 everything they do is they're dumb. They don't know what they're talking about, but you know who does know what they're talking about? The Bronze Age goat herders from the past. They got it right. Modern biology, wrong. They got it right, and we know that because they wrote it down in their heavily edited compilation of the inane babblings of a particular tribe of Bronze Age nomadic goat herders in the Levant. And if you think that trumps modern science, I mean, 
I've got some uh, land to sell you. Send me a uh, message and we'll work out that deal, Kent. Okay, thank you, thank you uh, James W., for your uh, concluding statement. And now we're going to hand it uh, to Dr. Dino. You have up to five minutes for your concluding statement. Go ahead, uh, Ken. Oh, oh, hang on. I started it wrong. Uh, give me just one second here. All right. Well, thank you, uh, James, for being brave enough to do this and for counseling with Mr. Nelson to try to get advice. I'll do, I'll do him. His phylogeny challenge, show me where these charts are wrong, Okay. This chart shows an amoeba or protozoa in this case, but a single cell creature turning to a human. I'd be willing to challenge Mr. Nelson or you or anybody else who believes in evolution. Show me any examples in the laboratory today where a protozoa produces something other than a protozoa. The textbook says the protozoa turned to a human. I think that's lying. I think that's nonsense. I think it's non-science for sure. This one shows animals and fungi and plants having a common ancestor. How about this one? The bats and the horses and the cats and the dolphins and the rats all have a common ancestor. I'll tell you exactly where it breaks down. Nobody's ever seen, let's start at the first one. Let's call it a bacteria to make it simple. Nobody's ever seen a bacteria produce a non-bacteria. Nobody's ever seen that. You guys believe it. You put the lines on paper and say, oh, this is proof. We evolved from a primitive unicellular organism well, I would agree that probably all the humans in the world had a common ancestor. His name was Adam. And they've diversified to brown ones and black ones or dark brown ones and light brown ones and blonde hair and you know, blue eyes and green eyes and red hair. There's a lot of varieties of humans out there, a lot of varieties of intelligence, some even dumb enough to believe they came from a rock. Yeah, but that's okay. They're still human. We still accept them, okay? They can still drive on the highway, but watch out for them, okay? So the fact there's a lot of humans, I agree. But they draw this chart saying humans and Let's see. Birds have a common ancestor. Nobody's seen that. Nobody's ever seen any evidence for this. You interpret it that way because you want to not have that goat herder's manual be true. I know that because it says thou shalt not do some things. Apparently, some of the people like to do. So of course, they don't like that book. But it's pure religious speculation to believe anything inside the circle. I got humans, birds, crocodiles coming from an ancestor that's common. This is not science. They draw these lines on paper. Look at this. The turtle and the bird had a common ancestor. This is baloney. You can believe that if you want. This is America, the land of the fee and the home of the slave. And you can believe anything you want. But that's not science. Science deals with what we can observe, study, test, and demonstrate. Look it up. It comes from the Latin word seer, which means to know. What do we know? Well, we know turtles make baby turtles. We know turtles have parents that are turtles that we know we know that okay we do not know turtles and birds have a common ancestor you don't know that you can believe that if you want but it's not science so i'll take Aaron nelson's uh phylogeny challenge where is the evidence of any amoeba or bacteria producing a non-bacteria because they have a short generation time so one human can observe the equivalent of a whole lot of time for, you know, they get grow up, get married, have babies in, you know, 20, 30 minutes. You get a whole bunch of generations in one day with bacteria. So where's the evidence of a bacteria ever producing a non-bacteria in the laboratory? I would like to see that, please, Mr. Nelson or James. Where is it? There's none. But you guys expect all the kids in the world to be taught this and learn it on a test and fail if they don't get it, showing that tomatoes and moss have a common ancestor. Wow, look at that, boys and girls. They drew a bunch of lines on paper. The elephant and the pig and the hippo and the horse have a common ancestor. I resent that being taught at taxpayer expense. It is baloney. It's a lie. I think it's criminal to teach such nonsense to kids and force everybody to learn it. Go start a private school. All you evolutionists, go to every town. We're going to have a private school to teach kids evolution. Send your kids. Pay tuition. Nobody would come. you got to force everybody to pay for that stupid religion to be taught. Anyway, so again, we got 30 topics on the table. Uh, um, Donnie, we're going to have to, I guess, figure out a way to say, stop, stop. You're changing to a new topic now, one topic at a time. That's why I do, when I do my whack an atheist Wednesday night, I go, stop, let's look at, here's what he said. Let's analyze that. I talked about your gill slits. It's not true. Stop using it. Look up the magazines I referenced, Science Magazine, New Scientist, uh, London, uh, embryology professor. It's not true. Stop using it. 
but you guys can't stop using it because all the evidence you have for evolution has been proven wrong. All of it. There's nothing. Watch my video, Lies in the Textbooks, where I cover or document everything. There is no evidence for evolution. The purpose of this debate tonight is for you to provide evidence for evolution. I think you lost. There's none. Go ahead. Okay, just on time. Much appreciated. Let me uh, restart this. And uh, gentlemen, thank you for the engaging uh, debate. Tons of fun. And also, uh, let me see here. got a couple super chats. Looks like there's two after shows. So it looks like the creationist side is having an after show and then the evolutionist side as well. So this is a super chat from Logical, Plausible, Probable. Uh, he says, uh, in the after show, I'll be reading from a paper apparently debunking Haeckel. Okay. So he's got a link uh, in the chat as well. And uh, James W., I believe uh, you're also having an after show if you wanted to announce it. Yeah, it's on the uh, Atheist Junior channel. I sent you that link, Donnie, if you wouldn't mind posting it in the uh, chat. I know Kent is well acquainted with Atheist Junior, so uh, it'll be fun. Why don't you I'll come on, him. Kent? I'll debate him anytime. Bring it on, Atheist Junior. <laughs> All right. Thanks for keeping it fun, gentlemen. Okay, so what we've been trying to do as well with this Evolution Debate Challenge series, since we've been doing so many of them, we're trying to limit them to around an hour and a half. So uh, I'm going to start the questions now and, and we're going to get through as many as we can. I'm going to put, put a timer so we don't go for too long. And uh, I want to thank everybody ahead of time who sent in uh, just comments and, and super chats, not really with any questions, but just showing uh, their appreciation for the debate. So I appreciate it. Thank you so much. And first question comes in from God and Gun Klinger. Uh, James W., this question is for you. So I'll put it up on screen and we'll read it out. So he says, how many mutations are allowed before humanity becomes extinct with an overabundance of mutations? Go ahead, James. All right. So this is that genetic entropy fallacy that uh, I'm sorry to say is so promoted, especially on this channel. And that is uh, kind of the creationist new go-to thing after irreducible complexity was shown not to be true. They've kind of clung to this genetic entropy thing. And, uh, no, mutations are just variations within within species, and over time that produces evolution. But these mutations can be beneficial, neutral, or harmful, overwhelming the most of them are neutral, and so they don't impact the survival of the organism. The few that are beneficial have a good effect. The few that are deleterious have a bad effect. But um, there's no limit because the bad ones will be filtered out by natural selection. Thank you. Thank you, James W. for that response. Over to you, Dr. Dino, for your response. Well, he demonstrated great faith that mutations will do it. He said, and he's right, mutations are harmful, fatal, or neutral. Where are the beneficial ones? Show me some. You would need trillions of them to change an amoeba to a whale. Trillions and trillions and trillions. Mutations happen. I agree. It's a mistake. Something goes wrong in the genetic code copying. It's a really complicated code. Here's a five-legged bull built a leg in the wrong spot. There's no, no new information uh, added. There's no scientific evidence to support the evolution theory except lies. Here's a mutated sheep called the short-legged sheep. Somebody capitalized on it and said, hey, I'm going to raise a whole bunch of these because they can, you know, have smaller pastures or something, or whatever the reason. They decided to capitalize on it. Somebody took dogs and you took a mutation, ended up with a chihuahua, and they, now they breed the dumb things and sell them. People are dumb enough to buy those. We wouldn't use them for shark bait. It's a dumb dog, but it, they got them, okay? Ch Chihuahuas. It's still a dog. Mutations happen. There's a mutated turtle. Not ninja, but it's mutant. And nobody makes a double neck turtle neck sweater. Mutations only change around existing genetic information. I can rearrange the letters of Christmas and get all kinds of words. You're never going to get Xerox, Zebra, or Queen out of there. Here's a mutated fly. This textbook says normal flies have two wings. Good observation. This mutant has four. But guess what? It can't fly. What is it, a crawl now? There, sure, mutations happen. Why don't you give an example, James, of the best you know of for a beneficial mutation? By the way, keep in mind, you got to get two, male and female, at the same time in history. That's a problem for your billions of years. And in the same location. And they got to find each other. Anyway, where is the science of a mutation that is beneficial taking over a population? Where is it? 
Okay, thank you, uh, Kent, for that response. James W., uh, to be fair, the question was for you, so we'll give you uh, the final word. Go ahead. Where beneficial mutations become traits. So if we look, Kent, in the fossil record, you will see a point where there were no feathers before this point. You will see after that there are feathers. Like I said, it's only reasonable to assume they evolved during that period. And by the way, we've shown that feathers can evolve from reptilian scales. They are modified scales. We've seen shown alligators, Kent, that show pro that they can mutate, get proto feathers. And no, they weren't originally used for flight, but evolution will use what it has. And it has turned, it has developed many diverse organisms on the earth and mutation is the engine natural selection is what propels the everything forward and uh it happens can you know that evolution you are okay with microevolution. you just disagree about the time scale i'm saying well what you're saying is you could drive a car down the road but you could never ever ever drive that same car through the same mechanism to another county or another state but you can, Ken. It's the exact same mechanism. Uh, I'm glad I'm uh, entertaining you. I'm glad we're keeping this fun. So uh, go ahead, Ken. <laughs> Question, right, James? Or should I respond to that? I um, believe we move on to the next question. Okay. But it, it, if Ken wants right. to res respond, that's fine. Well, I'm I'm very curious about these alligators growing feathers. I want to see some of that. Yeah. That, I, I, I'd like one of them for the museum. Here, bring it on. I'll, I'll pay money for that. An alligator with feathers. I want to see that. Any of you folks in Louisiana, my I'll friends over the there, article. I need, I need some alligator skulls for our museum. And if you find one with feathers, I'll give you $1,000. Bring it over. Okay. Oh, it's down from the $250,000 challenge, but uh, I, I, I'm we'll broke. take it. I'm broke. Okay. I got a bunch of people living here eating food and I got to pay for everything. So, uh, <laughs> down from 250 yeah <laughs> <laughs> okay and the 250 off the $250,000 offer I had for years some million millionaire was backing me up on that I didn't have the money but he said I'll back you up offer him a quarter million because I started off with a $10,000 offer and uh, I started off at a thousand somebody said let's make it 10 I'll back you up another guy said I'll make it a quarter million I said okay it's your money nobody ever offered any evidence for evolution either you haven't either yet James tonight I mean <laughs> to be fair Kent that challenge you did have a lot of criteria that made it virtually impossible to meet the challenge. So his money was always pretty safe, I would say. But oh, yeah. Well, okay, for you, I want to see a feathered alligator. You, James, I'll give you the thousand dollars, but I get to keep the alligator. I'll send you right, the guys, article. Let's... Kent. No, okay, not guys, an article. Let's... I want to see the alligator. <laughs> well, I'm not a scientist, obviously, but <laughs> there you go. Neither are okay. you, but we're we're just discussing science. So thank you, Kent. <laughs> if I could have a pet alligator with feathers on it, that would be pretty cool. So, uh, okay. Cool. Let's would you admit back. evolution was true, though? <laughs> or if I had a pet alligator with, with feathers, feathers, a feathered alligator. <laughs> okay. More questions there, uh, Donnie? Or yeah, let's do it. Hey, if you if you guys are good, let's move on. So this We're is good. Stephen. I appreciate the uh, the super chat there, Stephen. So he uh, ten dollars super chat. Uh, Steve, brother, uh, I got it up on screen here again. This is for you, Jay. So that would be you, James. So he asks, Bring if there on. are millions of humans and millions of monkeys, why aren't there millions of in-between animal slash mammal slash humanoid beings? Well, like I said before, between us and Lucy, which lived about 2.8 million years ago, you would expect there to be 128,000 generations. And at no point during that was there a large change from one generation to the next. Never happened. That's a straw, you're straw manning evolution when you think that you're going to have a large scale change in the short term. We're saying is a very small changes over a long period of time can accumulate and add up to big changes. It's very similar to how language evolved. If you went back a thousand or fifteen hundred years ago and you read something in English, you wouldn't be able to make heads or tails of it. It's still English. It just evolved over time. And at no point was it different day to day, year to year. It was always very similar. But these small changes added up over time. And that's what we see in the fossil record. We see lots of animals that didn't ex don't exist today 
they obviously existed before and not just one or two of them. We find multiple examples of the same animal again, doesn't live today and is not the same as any modern animal. Okay. Thank you for that response there. Uh, James W. We'll hand it over to Kent. If you uh, had a response. I think you'd find nearly every fossil found has a counterpart today that is the same or very similar. There are living clams today, bunches of them. They look just like this, only they're not turned to rock. There are beavers today. We got some in our lake up here. You can come see them. And there are fossil beavers. I think you're wrong, James. I think nearly all animals today have been found as fossils, and nearly all fossils that have been found have a counterpart alive today. There, the question was, there are millions of humans, I agree, billions of them, and millions of monkeys, maybe billions of those too. I don't know. Why aren't there any millions of in-between? Because it didn't happen. Stephen, send me the 10 bucks. It didn't happen. There is no, it didn't happen. They're dreaming. Lucy is dead. Lucy, you can't prove Lucy had any kids at all. None. You can't prove that, but you guys are going to change it. Well, she had parents. You, they, they deliberately divert because they can't answer the question. Where are Lucy's children and where's the scientific evidence? Don't say, well, we're here, so we must be. No, that's not science. That's a belief system. So all the homos that they gave uh, tonight uh, are dead. And somebody chose to put a label on them. Go ahead. Thank you, Kent. And uh, James, a, a quick final word since it was your question. Go ahead. So I would just say that we know that these animals, exist. we have evidence of them, not just Lucy. We have many examples of Australopithecines. We have examples of other pre-human, pre-homo sapien humans. And no, they are not the same as modern humans. And no, they are not the same as apes. They are the only logical conclusion is that they are transitional species. And I know that's hard to uh, cope with and then you'll try to make it so they're not, but they still are what they are. And uh, they're transitional. They are evidence for evolution. And uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you for that final word. And uh, we'll give you a chance to have a really quick response to this, James. Uh, George Bond in the chat, he is coming at you. Uh, somebody, he gave a super chat. So we'll, uh, you know, to be fair, we will uh, put it up on screen. $10 super chat from Australia. I appreciate it. Bond, George Bond. So he says, uh, elongated scales are not feathers. What are your thoughts on that, James? It's funny that, you know, if you had an intelligent designer, he could just design things from scratch. Why does, why would the designer only use what's available to him, which is exactly what you would expect if evolution were true. And we do know that feathers are highly modified scales and they apparently provided an advantage to the, to the dinosaurs where they first manifested before birds had ever even evolved. Again, reversing the order of creation because uh, the Bible says birds were created first, but we know that's not the case. We know that reptiles emerged first and birds uh, came from them. So when you eat chicken nuggets at McDonald's, you are eating dinosaurs and uh, yeah, you're eating dinosaur. Okay. Thank you, uh, James. Uh, Dr. <clears throat> Dino, anything you want to add to that? Okay. Oh, I could tell years onto that one. Okay. He claims we know the Bible's wrong because the Bible says birds were made first and then reptiles. And he knows reptiles came first and then birds because of the layer that they're buried in. James, let me explain to you. If there was a flood that destroyed all life at one time, birds would be found on top because they're lighter and they're the last ones to die. They can fly around till they run out of gas till the reptile can't. He can't fly. So they might be sorted in that order and they're not always sorted in that order. But even if they were, it still wouldn't prove evolution. It would prove reptiles have a different body density than birds. Bird feathers are hollow. Their bones are hollow. They float. Of course, they're buried in a different layer. Duh, that's the flood. Textbooks teach that the feathers uh, came from scales. This is baloney. Bird feathers are phenomenal. Study one under the microscope. They're amazing. They are designed to be feathers, okay? They're both made of the same protein. That's it. I bet my nails we use out here on the building project are built of the same uh, metal that the car is made out of, iron. Doesn't prove any relationship. Morphological level feathers are traditionally considered homologous with reptilian scales. However, this is Journal of Evolutionary Biology 25 years ago. 
in development, morpho uh, morphogenesis, gene structure, protein shape and sequence, filament formation and structure, feathers are different. Clearly feathers provide a unique and outstanding example of an evolutionary novelty. He still believes in evolution. You gotta you know, say that or it won't get published. But he said, it's unique. Are you showing Feather slides, Kent? I, I don't see the slides yes. up. Steve, please don't do anything else except focus on this, okay? Take the, shut that off, okay? All right. Feathers and scales are not related. They're both designed, okay? They're designed to, be, to do exactly what they do. Feathers are designed so it can fly. Scales are designed to keep the water off or so it can swim or, and have armor if somebody wants to eat it. So if you want to believe this is a relationship because they're both made of keratin, that's true. That, I mean, that's, that's your religion. But as I said, birds are found on top of reptiles because of the different body density and the different order of, they would die at a different time. Birds can survive longer in a flood than reptiles can. So you're simply wrong, James, okay? Next question. Okay, thank you, uh, Kent, for that response. I, and, I would just respond yeah, quickly ahead, that you would, expect, you would expect to find one example, though, of a bird who was buried below where a bird can't be. And we've never seen that, Kent. We've never, we've never seen that. We, if you could show that, you would probably win a Nobel Prize in biology, Kent, because you would overthrow evolution. But you haven't been able to produce that evidence, so. Okay, let's, uh, let's, okay, so I got two more super chats I got to get through, um, and then we're going to call it here. So we got about uh, 500 questions that came in, guys. So in the chat, I appreciate you guys being so engaging uh, and involved in the, in this epic debate. So this one is for you, uh, Dr. Hoven. Christopher Silvius sends in a $5 super chat. He asks, uh, Hoven, why do people that convert from YEC to atheism think their conversion is evidence for atheism? Well, as James pointed out in the beginning, he thought, uh, I forget exactly what he said, was uh, uh, he began to study the evidence. He gave over to reason and evidence. They really think yes. they're smart. They think they have studied and no. wow, they are smart now because they gave up on this goat herder's manual and turned to believing they came from a rock. That's a real advancement in your intelligence. So some people convert from young earth creation, YEC, to atheism. Many more convert from atheism to young YEC. I think anybody, everybody's going to convert to YEC when they stand before God. They're going to say, wow, there is a God, okay? So, yes, I think, uh, I don't know that we could prove that uh, the question is even legitimate or true, but if some people convert one way or the other, I think some people like atheism a whole lot better. There's no rules. <clears throat> that does sound pretty nice. Do what you want. I would like to ask James sometime, maybe a whole debate on this, Donnie. How do evolutionists tell right from wrong? Where's the standard? How do you tell right from wrong? Anyway, that wasn't the question though. So why do people that convert think their conversion is evidence of atheism? Because they're stupid. Go ahead. Well, uh, James, anything you want to add? Kent, I wouldn't say I was stupid when I was a Christian. I wouldn't say you're stupid now because you still are a Christian. I would just say that for me, I was not unhappy as a Christian. I actually liked the idea that I would get to live forever and be with God and be happy. I actually liked the idea that my father, who passed away when I was six, he died suddenly. I never had a chance to say goodbye. I always liked holding on to the hope that he would be in heaven and I would get to see him one day. I just came to the realization that there's no rational reason to believe that's true. And no matter how good it sounds, no matter how wonderful it would be if it were true that does not make it actually true and you come up to a point where you have to be honest with yourself and you have to be honest with what you believe and it was it was a process it wasn't overnight it wasn't like uh i became smarter and became an atheist no i'm the same person i just had a different understanding of the uh the reality that we live in and I chose or I, my mind accepted the reality of that as much as I might not have liked it. Okay. Question was for you, Kent, you get the final word. Well, uh, yeah, being, it doesn't make it not true either. You said it doesn't make it true. It also doesn't make it not true. It's not evidence either way. We have to choose to believe in God by faith. If I found this laying out in the parking lot, I think it'd be logical for me to say, you know, 
I'd bet this didn't come. I bet this didn't happen by chance. I bet somebody designed this. I think that's logical to believe an ink pen had a designer. I think it's logical to think a feather had a designer. They're mind boggling in their complexity. I think it's designed pretty cool. Usually the rachis is off center. So as they flap their wings down, the feathers close like Venetian blinds. When they pull their wings up, they open, let the air go through. Otherwise they'd fly like this every time, pushing air up, pushing air down. No, no. I think they're designed for flight. They're amazing. Those that don't have it off center have done the, the, done the middle of the shaft. The shaft goes down the middle of the feather. They're designed for warmth, body temperature, keep them warm. They can fluff them up and stay warm. I think there's evidence for design everywhere we look. I'm sorry to hear about your father. Uh, that's not evidence either way, though. No. You could have chosen no. to say, I'll accept it. I have three children here and three in heaven. I understand. Tragedy. But it's okay, God, I love you anyway. Go ahead. Okay, thank you, gentlemen. And here we go. Final question for the night. Uh, thank you so much to the debaters for the time that you have given to us uh, for this important debate. So this one comes in from Brandon McGavin. And this one is for you, James. So uh, Brandon asks, why did Darwin, the ship captain comforter, or wait, why did Darwin, the ship captain comforter, is a more trustworthy, so I guess why is he to you a more trustworthy person than a goat herder, as you atheists always say? And do you feel there is faith involved in evolution? I, no, I would not say that there's faith, because as I said, you could disprove evolution. It is falsifiable. Religion is what's not falsifiable because they will twist it and mold it and conform it to reality just to make it not. You can never prove it, but their real goal is to make it not falsifiable. And I would say that what Darwin produced is demonstrable. We can actually see it. We see organisms change over time. We look back in the fossil record and we see very different animals than we're alive today. And I know Kent has some very fanciful explanations for that, some very ad hoc reasons why he thinks that is, but we don't have any evidence for that. Outside of evidence for the supernatural, the reasonable conclusion is that there is a natural process at work, which is all we've ever seen. We've never seen anything else. You look inside life, you look inside the cell. What do you see? What's going on inside the cell? The same thing that goes on outside the cell. The same thing. It's the only thing we've ever observed in history, matter and energy obeying the laws of physics. Nothing else has ever happened. The only place where we hypothesize something else happens is inside a black hole because our physics go to hell once we go to that level of gravity. But outside that, no, there's no magic inside the cell. It operates through chemistry and physics. And if something did not require, doesn't require magic to run, why would we then assume it must have taken magic to get it started? That's an erroneous assumption. Even though we don't know exactly how it started, the logical conclusion is that it started naturally, just like everything else we observe in reality. Okay, thank you uh, for the question, Brandon. Thanks for the response, James. And over to you, uh, Dr. Dino, for your response. Well, the question is a good one. I appreciate that, Brandon. Why was Darwin the ship captain comforter? Darwin was hired for zero money to sail around to be the captain, the captain of the ship's comforter because in those days in the British Navy, the captain and officers were not allowed to fellowship with the sailors. They had to keep very distinct, you know, don't even, don't talk to them about anything about, you know, just give them orders, okay? They had very strict. So they would hire somebody like Darwin or somebody would you go along on this voyage to be somebody the captain can talk to? That was Darwin's job. His dad was a medical doctor. Charlie couldn't find a job. So he said, hey, sail around for five years, take care of the captain, be his friend. You guys trust him, who had very little training in science, if any, to, 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 to and, and a goat herder, you guys keep saying that. Show me a problem with the Bible. Show me a contradiction. The Bible's made thousands of prophecies that have all come true. The Bible made a prophecy 2,000 years ago that there's going to come a time when you have to receive a mark to buy or sell. No longer cash. There's going to be a mark uh, to buy. That's what's prophesied 2,000 years ago. Thousands of prophecies have already come true. The rest of them are going to. So you guys can call it a goat herder manual if you want. I believe it's a message from God Almighty written through 40 different men with no contradictions. 
and I've been covering supposed contradictions in the Bible on my YouTube channel, Kent Hovind Official, for the last few months. I'll cover any more. If you know there's some, tell Mr. Nelson, send the best contradiction he knows of in the Bible, and I'll answer it. He doesn't want an answer, but I'll give it anyway, because some people have a brain and want to know the truth. So the, you know, why do you trust Darwin over uh, these men who often sacrifice their life to write and spread around what they did? I trust the Bible way beyond, way beyond Charlie's, Charlie Darwin. And you mentioned about matter and energy obey the laws of physics. I agree. Where did matter and energy come from? You guys came, came from a big bang of nothing exploding. That's not science. Matter obeys the laws of energy. Things wind down. They don't wind up. All the heat of the universe, all the stars, all the heat from the stars, all the energy ever expended in humanity in human history had to be in that dot. That's a hot dot. Not only crowded, but hot. I think the whole idea is stupid. And you don't accept evolution. You believe in evolution. Stop using the word accept. We accept what the scientific evidence shows. Scientific evidence shows dogs produce dogs, cows produce cows, no exceptions. That's what the evidence shows. You want to believe something other than that, then that you're, off, you're way outside the evidence. You're into religion, which is what I've been saying all along. Evolution is the dumbest and most dangerous religion in the history of the world. Okay, let's see. Uh, slide 3, 7, 36, L, D, B. Uh, go ahead. I'm done. Thank you, Kent. And uh, this being the last question, James W., we're going to hand it over to you for a final word. Well, then I would say, Kent, if you've got proof that it's wrong, falsify it. Nobody's ever been able to do that. No scientific study has ever produced a result that was inconcordant with evolution or that was indicative of magical special creation. We have no evidence to believe that. And as far as dots of nothing, that is a for, for, it's a completely separate theory. It's a completely separate area of science, but there is ample evidence to suggest the Big Bang. I know I've seen you debate that topic with other uh, scientists before, and uh, I got to say, I don't think you did very well in those debates, Kent, even though you are a skilled debater, you got lots of experience, and uh, you know, you've been doing this, Kent, for uh, 30 years. Kent, you've got your doctorate degree in education. You've got multiple other degrees. You taught high school science for 15 years. Why can't you propose a model? Why can't you explain what the biblical kinds are? If it's not going to be you, Kent, who's going to do that? Because you know, that'd be a great field of study for real biology once evolution is over. Why don't you do it, Kent? I mean, put forward a model, put forward some evidence. You don't do that because you know as soon as you did that, real science would blow that out of the water. So. All you can do is sit there and take pot shots and blow holes in evolution. But um, yeah, thank you, Kent. Okay, I have done that for the last 30 years. Put up a model. I got it all in my video series. You can watch the whole thing. I believe I God, created, God created everything in six days. That's the only way to explain the billions of symbiotic relationships. I believe there was a big flood that destroyed the world 4,400 years ago. That's the only way to explain the fossils, the polystrata trees. That's all I do all day, every day is explain the model. The Bible is true. The Bible said it right. I just try to teach it and explain it where people can get it. Uh, watch my YouTube channel. That's all I've done. What do you mean I don't put forth a model? Oh, we do. Done. Okay, James, last question. Last question. The Bible says 20 times in the first seven chapters, the animals will bring forth after their kind. Sure. What would you consider evidence of any animal producing babies that we can watch, watch it happen that is a beacon, anybody would consider a different kind? Are the amoebas producing different kind of life form, or are they still amoebas? Is the Great Dane still a dog? Is that a different kind of animal than it came from? Where's the evidence? Falsify the model has been given a long time ago. They're going to bring forth after their kind. That was given a long time ago. Do you have any evidence to counter that? But, but you can't still tell us, Kent, what a kind is. You need to keep that definition I, vague I that and nebulous <laughs> so that you can contort it and twist it to mean whatever you need it to mean at that time. And no, nothing ever produces a different kind of animal. That's exactly what evolution says. Evolution only diversifies. You, producing another kind of animal, Kent, would be like making a lateral jump on the tree of evolution. That's never going to happen. You're straw manning evolution. You're, uh, you're almost trying hard, Kent, not to understand it, because I know you really don't want, under, you don't want people to understand it, because, Kent, if they understood it, they might see how much sense it makes, and they might see 
how much more concordant with reality it is than uh, the fables that you so fervently cling to in the book of Genesis. Uh, yeah, thank you. Is that it, Donnie? <laughs> I'm not sure if you guys are doing a round two here. Well, or it's, uh, it's, it's been two, two, two hours, 20 time, minutes. But, uh, Donnie, on, on your channel, I covered a few weeks ago, I think, uh, what is a kind? They don't have a good definition of species. Let's see, there are 27 different definitions of species, I believe. This is difficult. Here's seven definitions, 27 variations and mixtures of species. How do you explain species? What are the three types, four types, seven types? Do you want to know? Species. So that's another you debate we did that two weeks ago. The point is, you, a, do, a Great Dane is still a dog, James. Dog. Go look at him. Do you want to know, Kent, why it's hard to draw the line at species? And that's because all species are transitional. So when you have accumulated change over time, it can be challenging to draw that exact line where just like it would be hard to draw the line between Latin and Italian. We know that Italian evolved from Latin, but no Latin speaker ever gave birth to a Italian speaking child. That never happened. It would be hard to draw that line, but yet we know over time change happened. So, well, uh, um, <laughs> we got go nowhere. Ahead. Thank you, Donnie. Uh, I'm ready to go to bed. I had a long day. <laughs> okay. Thanks, guys. Uh, all right, guys. I appreciate that. Uh, mini round two. At the, we'll consider those the final words, gentlemen, since okay. we just hit the two hour mark and we're going to let you guys get to bed. Uh, much uh, deserved uh, rest. So again, Kent, uh, James W., thank you so much for uh, doing this thank debate. You, Clearly, thank it was you, a much anticipated debate because we had 400 and feet, uh 450 people in the live chat. So you guys made for a fun debate. Uh, thank you so much. Kent and James W. Uh, Sand for Truth is signing out now. All right, I'm back, guys, just for a uh, couple minutes. There's another one in the in the books. That one was <laughs> that one was a wild one. Looks like we got a mini round two debate between James and Kent there at the end. Uh, last week we set a record with uh, T Jump and Kent Hoven. Uh, so if you haven't yet seen that debate, please check it out. That one was a ton of fun. That one uh, was historical for sure. So uh, there it is, right there. We had 440 people. And uh, we just set another record tonight. So uh, about 450, roughly, people live for this debate. This, uh, I believe, was about our 10th or 11th, uh, maybe 15th or 16th debate in this evolution debate series. Challenge if we consider uh, my debates and uh, Raw Matt and also Professor David McQueen. So we've all done uh, some good debates on this topic. And we have plenty more to come for everybody. Um, next week, uh, the debate is going to be between uh, Kent and Ken Rock, who was in the chat uh, tonight, so I appreciate it. Uh, this was probably the, the, the most wild I've ever seen the live chat, so you guys kind of cracked me up, and um, I'm going to have to put slow mode on, possibly, uh, during the next few uh, Evolution debates that we host. Uh, chat was very lively. Thank you so much, everybody, for the uh, super sticker, super chat support, and of course, all of your questions. Uh, we'll probably play around with um, with the format a little bit in in April for the April debates and see what we can do. Maybe shorten the openings and rebuttals a little bit. That way, we can get more audience questions. I'm not sure, but uh, two hours really does fly by. I mean, I, it's hard to believe this was two hours. Uh, it was a ton of fun, very enjoyable. Um, and we are going to be back tomorrow, actually. Not a debate, but we will be here for a uh, presentation with Dr. Ken Colson and an, an audience question and answer, a live Q&A, dinosaur soft tissue. And then at the end of the week, on the 18th, we have the much anticipated debate between Dr. Robertson Jenis and Kelly Powers. They are going to be debating Sola Fide. 
And uh, last thing I want to mention, guys, um, we've got two after shows, it looks like. So one over on Atheist Junior's channel and then another one over on Logical Plausible Probable's channel. So please check those out. I'm sure there is going to be a ton to discuss uh, based on this awesome debate. And the very last thing I want to mention, too, we announced a couple days ago that uh, for any new patrons, uh, you can find uh, our Patreon, the, the ministry Patreon in uh, the description box. Any new patrons that we get, uh, we are going to be emailing you uh, three free PDFs of uh, out of the many books that, that we've written. So uh, we greatly appreciate all the support, guys, all our members, our patrons and our uh, weekly donors. So you guys are the life and blood of this channel and you guys are the reason why we can uh, host these debates, we can put out full-time content and do so much uh, research for you. So any evolutionists uh, in, the, in the chat as well who wanna take the evolution debate challenge, uh, you can tell it's professional. James and, and Kent kept it uh, professional, sophisticated and equally timed. So uh, we make sure these are solid debates. If you're interested in uh, debating that topic, shoot me an email. Uh, you can find my email in the contact section of Standing for Truth Ministries dot com. So I appreciate it again, guys. This was uh, very lively, engaging and a ton of fun. And I guess we will see you over at the uh, after shows for tonight. Standing for Truth is really out this time. God bless all.